Well, it was a moment in our history starting back about 1853 when everything just kind of fell into place. And for obviously the most significant event to the windmill industry in Batavia was the presence of the Fox River. And the fact that the Fox River had a very wide berth as it comes through downtown Batavia in the main channel, I think was an attractive factor. But because Batavia had the ability at the north end of town to, to widen out what I think was nothing more than a small drainage creek into a second channel of the Fox River, uh, they came in with horses and plows and people with their backs and they hand dug a second channel of the Fox River in through downtown Batavia, which is the area today where the Depot Museum and the Peg Bond Center are. Well, that's, the, that's what's left of the second channel that was dug. And then the uh, river was then engineered with the dam to divert water into the second channel. And that's the reason that the dam sits at the north end is to service number one the challenge factory but also to be this diversion of this water through downtown Batavia. When you got to Chicago in the early part of the 1800s uh, up until about 1860 uh, everything west of here was the American frontier and you still had the Indians and the cowboys and you know no roads and no anything out there so this was the right on the edge of where the great market for the windmills was going to be and you had all the farms and the ranches out in the western part of the United States. And with the Great Lakes, you then had the power to go take the stuff to Chicago, put it on a ship and ship it worldwide. So Batavia really was in an ideal location because we, as we sat here just west of Chicago, we were literally on the frontier of the American frontier. We were right, right on the edge of it and the products could be easily shipped here and you didn't have to go through all the stuff on the east coast uh, of getting it here because you had the water power and you had the people with the connections to get the railroads in here and then you had the market right to the west of you. Dr. Baker encouraged us to go to a windmiller's trade fair and it just so happened in the summer of 1993 there was, no 1994, we got married in 93, uh, 94, there was a trade fair in um, Kendallville, Indiana, which also had a windmill manufacturing plant at one point. So Carla Hill, who was the, um, the director of the museum at the time, Bill Wood, who was the historian, and myself and Bob, um, I think Donna Dallasassi might have come with us too as the chamber president. We all took a field trip and went to this um, trade fair in Indiana, Kendallville, Indiana, in 1994. And we just, we were hooked. We were hooked. And um, realizing that we had this rich heritage, Bob stood up at the, at the banquet. They said, is anyone else uh, thinking about having a trade fair at some point? And Bob stood up in his excitement and said, Batavia wants to put their name in the ring for a future one. And everybody clapped because, oh, Batavia was, you know, the home of the grandfather of all windmills, the Halliday Standard, created by Daniel Halliday, who lived right here in town while he, you know, was involved with the factory. So that was how we got uh, interested in them. And then we started, we put the word out that we were interested in featuring them in our um, Riverwalk and the, you know, the references, the referrals started coming in for potential windmills for our, uh, for our display here. And uh, Bob wanted to put one of each of the three major manufacturing companies in the circle. And so he put out a word for uh, a U.S. wind engine and pump company windmill, a, uh, uh, a challenge windmill, and an Appleton Goodhue windmill. And this building here in front of us is the, the old Appleton Manufacturing Company. We also have the distinction here that we have three remaining windmill companies. I mean, they, don't, they no longer function as windmill companies, uh, but they've been repurposed into other business functions. We have the Challenge Company, the Appleton Manufacturing Company, and we have the U.S. Wind Engine and Pump Company. The other three companies were very minor and there were no remaining buildings uh, uh, with regard to them. We never thought we would find um, any of the three remaining smaller windmills, a windmill from those remaining companies. But then we found uh, a, a windmill called the Pearl from the Batavia Windmill Company and that's uh, right across from the police station, right behind us on the Appleton property. 
So that was a real coup, but we found that much later. That was in the 2000s, okay? So we hosted this trade fair in 1996, and we had over 400 people, more than anybody else had ever had in a trade fair before. And of course, we pulled out all the stops. We had, uh, we had people bring in rusty old iron, so it's, it's called a trade fair, but it's really like a swap and trade kind of a, a show and uh, vendors would come in and sell different windmill related things and um, uh, people would come in with rusty old windmills in various stages uh, of repair or disrepair. We held that out at the Public Works building in 1996. They, they kind of moved a lot of stuff over and gave us half of the building. So, and then, so we had the outside stuff, all the windmills on display outside and the stuff for sale on the inside. And it was a great, great show. So um, we directed people to housing, and um, we had uh, tours of the Halliday home. We had tours of the John Burnham home. Um, we had tours of the Challenge Windmill Factory and the U.S. Windmill Factory. We had people who had worked at the factories who were still living at the time, and we interviewed them at the various factories, at the, the two factories at the time. And uh, it was a really great, great show. And people who missed it were really, are you going to have it again? Are you have going to have it again? And it was such an effort. Um, but in 2011, we had attended a trade fair in Lamar, Colorado, and nobody had bid for 2012. And all the way home, I was twisting Bob's arm and saying, people keep asking us if we're going to do it again. Why don't we do it one more time? And he had already retired from the city, so he was afraid he would have lost some of his contacts and stuff like that. But we pulled it off, and we did another one in 2012, and that was hosted out at the high school. So Bob and I had some, some pretty cool road trips together. We had a lot of fun. Um, you know, one of, one of the trips was out to Nebraska. It was to a, a large windmill collector out there. Uh, we got to see a fantastic collection of uh, windmills that he had privately held. And then also while we're there, we were always working um, on relationships and networking and trying to find new windmills that we didn't have in the collection in Batavia yet and uh, try to you know be the first ones to get our hands on those or call dibs on them and then work on trying to get those moved back to town. Windmills were, were a, really an engineering marvel. The, the way that they worked, they were, you know, those windmills, so when you look at a windmill that's up on a tower, it's actually balanced up there. It's sitting, it's sitting in a rounded area that's uh, called the tower cap, and it sits on top of a bearing that allows it to turn freely from side to side. But it, there's really a very delicate balance between the wheel and the tail, and there's some precision that's done when it comes to the weights of both of those and to keeping that counterbalanced up there so that it doesn't uh, list or tip or one way or the other. There's also a lot that goes into the braking mechanisms of them and how the tail folds up and then actuates a brake against the hub to keep the windmill from spinning in high winds and, and destroying itself, literally, when, when the winds get high. So, um, you know, the way they're geared to, um, to magnify, you know, amplitude based on, you know, the size of the gears and things, there's, there's a lot that goes into them and the more you learn about them, the more fascinating it is. So, when, when, if you come to Batavia to, to check out one of the most fantastic collections of windmills uh, available to be viewed in the, in the Midwest, you know, look around and, and just take it in. The fact that the buildings that those windmills were built in are still standing here. Uh, the people that used to work in those, those factories still have family members that live in this town. Uh, the windmills themselves and, and the beauty of them, the elegance, the engineering, and just the, the general curiosity that went into someone saying, I think I can build one of these in the trial and error. The foundries that made all the parts for those windmills are still around in the area. Um, you, you really get a good snapshot and you can almost feel yourself being taken back in time and some of the sounds and some of you know what would have gone on back then when these windmills were in their heyday and were being manufactured on large scales. Um, my name is Stacy Peterson. I'm the Adult Services Manager at the Batavia Public Library. And I became involved in windmills because our new director at the time, George Sheets, joined the library staff 
a number of years ago. And coming to town, he noticed all of the windmills that were around town and asked if there was a guide to them. And we said, no. And he said, here's an opportunity. So we began doing some research. And the more research that I did, the more absorbed that I got in the windmill topic and began talking with um, Dr. T. Lindsey Baker in Texas, who wrote the big book about windmills, who graciously shared an enormous wealth of information with us and continues to be a resource today. Um, so that's how the topic became part of my life. And as, the more that I learned about the windmills, um, the more absorbed I became. Um, and at this point, it's something that I notice on the landscape whenever I travel anywhere. I'll point out windmills as I'm driving by on the interstate. I always take note and some of them I can identify by name, which is a little bit geeky. One of my jobs with the city has been to assist with the maintenance of the city's windmill collection. Um, I started getting involved with the windmills uh, around the same time former assistant administrator Bob Popick was getting ready to retire, who Bob had brought a lot of these windmills back to Batavia and um, the city needed another employee that would be willing and able to help and assist with the maintenance of the windmills. So I was recruited out of the Public Works Department to provide some assistance with the maintenance. And that's um, how we've gotten here today to uh, talk a little bit about the maintenance of the windmills and the ongoing maintenance uh, going forward. So what I have in my hands today is part of one of our wooden windmill collections. Uh, the windmill behind me is an old uh, U.S. Uh, wind engine and pump company windmill. And you can see it has different sections or uh, blade sections on the windmill. Um, the, the portion I'm holding in my hand today is part of that, that the wood has decayed enough and I'll show you where part of it has broken here. This is all cypress wood, but over a period of time, all the wood deteriorates because uh, it's just the nature of it, even with uh, regular painting and maintenance. But this part of the mill has failed enough where the city has now uh, is going to have to invest in getting a replacement part for it. As we went up and inspected this mill recently, we determined that the rest of the wooden sections of this mill are also in poor enough condition that while we're up there, we're just going to replace all the sections instead of just this one section. The city is now in the process of soliciting the community for some additional funds to help maintain uh, the uh, count that we can use for the maintenance of these mills.